Hi, I'm Dr. Fred Kalev III from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And today, I'm gonna to talk about mapping Mars for rovers. As you can imagine, sending a rover to another planet is a big endeavor. And we wanna have the most accurate maps as possible so we can find the scientifically interesting areas as well as areas that are very safe for the rover to land. So it can't just be done by one person. It requires a large team. So we have people from the US Geological Survey that created our base maps as well as people from JPL on the terrain relative navigation team who took those base maps and provided corrections to the original data, such as the camera models and the instrument timings, as well as the people who helped find scientifically interesting areas and safe areas like the Council of Terrains, as well as people like myself, who day to day make maps for both the science and engineering teams to keep track of where the rover is, where it's going to be, and all the science that it's done over the lifetime of its mission. So here's Earth. Looks familiar, right? You got the oceans, you have continents, you have ice at both the North and South Pole. And if you look close, you can see mountains and volcanoes and such. Mars is similar, but a little bit different, a lot drier. There's no liquid water on Mars currently because it dried out about three billion years ago. But you do see some evidence of water, such as the ice caps in North and South. It does get clouds and you can also see things like mountains and volcanoes and valleys and places where we think water was in the past. So one of the exciting things about Mars is that three to four billion years ago, it was kind of like Earth. There was potentially an ocean, there was lakes, there was running water, and maybe, just maybe, the possibility of life on the surface, developing similar as Earth. Unfortunately, when we look at Earth three to four billion years ago, most of those rocks have been destroyed by plate tectonics. But on Mars, those rocks are almost completely preserved so we go to Mars so we can see what Earth was like three to four billion years ago, as well as to answer one of these big questions, does life develop everywhere in the universe or is Earth one of these only special places? So you saw that little white circle on that map, that's Jezero Crater, that's where we sent the Perseverance rover. And so here's a look at it a little bit closer. It's about 50 kilometers across and that little uh, blue grayish ellipse, that's where we wanted to land the rover right near this river delta. So we think actually uh, Jezero Crater was actually a lake, an ancient lake filled with water, and we have sea stream channels coming in and out, and that river delta where we're gonna land that we think is the best place to look for past evidence of ancient life, ancient organics. So here's the Perseverance rover. It's about a SUV sized vehicle, and it's composed of a variety of science instruments from a lot of different countries. For example, from Norway, we have the ground penetrating radar, RIMFAX from France, we have the SuperCam instrument, and then uh, we have instruments from the US like Pixel and Sherlock out on the arm, which will actually look for those organics within the rocks. We can also look at a 3D model of the rover. So here it is, and on the end of the turret, there's a bunch of instruments. We have Pixel and Sherlock and the coring drill, which actually take a piece of rock from the surface and put it into a tube for a future Mars sample return will actually bring some of those rocks back in a future mission. We also have the mass instrument where we have the science camera, mass cam Z, as well as that Cyclops like eye uh, super cam, which actually shoots a laser out to the rocks, vaporizes them, and then looks at the colors of that vapor to determine the chemistry and mineralogy. And so together, all these instruments make up the science package so we can investigate the science and the rocks on the surface but we have to start with a map for the rover to land on and for the scientists to investigate where's the best place to go. So we start by taking visible images from satellites in orbit around Mars, usually at two different angles, so we can create a stereo photo, so we can generate elevation models and slope maps and cost maps, so we can actually pretend to drive the rover over and see how long it will take to look at all the science areas. But so it's not only for safely landing on the surface, you know, where are there big rocks or big hills and where can we go in between, but also being able to drive to these scientifically interesting areas and investigate the rocks the science team is most interested in. So on a mission, we create a lot of maps. Everyone wants to know where's the rover now and where is it going? So we start with just maps of like a whole landing site. For in this example, a lot of maps from the Curiosity rover, the placement of different high resolution images in the crater, maps of elevation and where the rover has gone and where it's been and where it's going to go places where the rover had drilled into the surface and collected very high resolution data sets and chemistry inside of its internal instruments. 
and just maps in general, keeping track of every rock that we've actually taken a picture of or shot with a laser or taken the arm out and put the instrument onto, as well as publications based on these scientific results so that we can share it with other scientists and the world. So Perseverance Rover did something really special. Normally, our maps are used for landing in terms of a statistical sense, like this basic 25 kilometer area is safe to land in, but pretty much anywhere. However, Jezero was really special. Back on the Curiosity rover, Jezero crater was deemed unlandable because with that landing system, it could not figure out what was safe and what was not within the, this landing ellipse. However, Perseverance has terrain relative navigation, which is a new technology where we actually carry maps on board for the first time on a spacecraft and it uses those maps in real time as it's landing to figure out where it is as it's coming down onto the surface. So typically on Mars, we know where a spacecraft is within plus or minus 300 meters. Not safe enough to land in a very hazardous area like Jezero. So it takes pictures as it's coming down and then it matches it up to this map, this visible map, and then it knows where the rover is within five meters, which is a huge improvement. And then it needs to decide where on the surface can we land? Where is it safe? So also on board is the second map on the right, the hazards map, which shows safe areas to land in blue, as well as um, hazardous areas in red, big rocks, high hills, deep sand pits. And so you can see from that little white circle, that's where the rover landed. And it, you can, if you look really close, it's a, just a nice little light blue patch of safe area between two big red ones. So terrain relative navigation literally made this mission uh, safe and success for years to come. So again, we take these maps from the engineering world into the science world. We use those elevation models to look at the geology, both in 2D and 3D, as well as develop the geologic maps to show where the rocks are most interest to the science team and can we visit them with the rover and which rocks would we like to visit and collect samples from. But as you know, in the GIS world, we've gone from our static paper maps to fully interactive web-based maps. And we do the same thing both for our internal science team and engineering teams, as well as for all of you. So you can follow along uh, at our NASA websites and watch the rover progress day to day and see where the helicopter is flown. And we really hope you join us in this adventure because every day is a new view on the planet of Mars. And thank you so much for having me.